Welcome to the inner world of filmmaking. I'm your host, Tammy McGarrow. I'm an editor, podcaster, and still photographer. In this show, I will interview filmmakers in all facets of production and distribution. I'm excited to introduce Jennifer Carrier, who is a script supervisor who has worked on shows like The Haves and the Have Nots, Ruthless, Young Dylan, and so many more. Welcome, Jennifer, to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Oh, good. Um, so I'm so excited to dive into the role of the script supervisor. And I was just kind of curious, like, how did you get into film and setting your sights on being a script supervisor? So that was a total accident. I did not know what a script supervisor was for the first two years of my film and TV career. And also, I had no intention of going into film and TV. So um, I studied French and engineering. I uh, My first job out of college, I was an assistant director and then ultimately director of a French nonprofit, a worldwide organization. And then I left to go pursue my civil engineering dreams, um, had a nice comfy job set up at the uh, Corps of Engineers in New Orleans, where I'm from. An actor friend of mine had asked me to fill in a literal entry level position one day on a TV show back in 2007 because they needed someone who was my height and complexion to stand in for an actor. So I had the time that I could take away from work. So I took one day off, went and worked on the show. And when I stepped onto the TV set, I was like, oh, um, I'm not going to be able to walk away from this. I feel something here. So at the Corps of Engineers, I was able to freeze my job status without penalty for up to six months, which I promptly did and just went and worked on that entire first season of that TV show. That is until the 2007-2008 writer's strike interrupted production. Um, no sooner had I you know, walked away from my engineering job, I was set up for life, that I ended up having to walk away from film and TV right away. And so I just made it work and figured it out until the um, industry came back in early 2008. So I did not know what a script supervisor was. I tried every single department, you know, uh, producer's assistant, director's assistant, wardrobe, camera. I was um, a, cam a union camera utility when I found out what a script supervisor is. So it was one of my camera assistants who was like, you know, your personality might be really well suited to this job. Why don't you go talk to that guy over there? That guy, the one a wonderful person named Sam, I won't say his last name right now, but um. He ended up becoming my script supervisor and my script supervising mentor. Um, I thought he was a director's assistant or something. I had no idea what his job was. And he totally took me under his wing, helped me get into the industry. And um, yeah, I could just I owe it all to him, frankly, for getting me involved. So I found my breakthrough role as a script supervisor. Wow. You know, it is kind of fun and interesting where our life takes us. And the roles that we end up going into, I have a friend that always says, sometimes you just have to feed the baby hippopotamuses because you never know where that's going to land you. And I've always taken that, that, you know, you never know when you're meeting people and you're working on set and working in different departments where you're going to then focus your energy. Now, it's yeah, kind of interesting. I, it was so unexpected. Um, and But it just, it felt so right. So um, whereas, you know, in camera... I mean, camera is amazing, but and I loved working with a big crew, whereas a script supervisor is a department of one, you know, it's department head and department of one. Um, still, you're right in the in the thick of it. You know, you're in the inner circle. You're literally like making creative decisions and having creative discussions with the actors and the director and the producer representing the screenwriter on set. There's always, always some problem to solve before it happens. So I'm always like in problem solving mode, anticipating anything that could go wrong, which is incredibly rewarding for me. Um, I just like to be like in the thick of it and, and always having something to do. I don't like to, to sit still. So. Well, it's a very detail oriented job. It I, is. And, and really you have to be thinking, I mean, I feel like it's, it's a very stressful job because you have to think about so many different things that are going on that Everybody's focused on one thing, but I think with the script supervisor, you're kind of focused on multiple things. You are. You so are. So other departments maybe can like single task, but we truly have to. I don't believe in multitasking. I believe in switching between tons of tasks very quickly because we truly can only focus on one thing at a time. So in that sense, yeah, we're like zipping around constantly um, just, you know, between tasks. But I don't describe it as a high stress job, but I would describe it as a high pressure job. 
but I don't mind that. I actually work really well under pressure. A lot of the people that I've trained and brought into the industry as script supervisors, they say the same thing. They work well under pressure and they like, you know, just being in the cockpit with everybody, putting out fires and making decisions and, you know, creative uh, problem solving. Yeah. Well, I guess it takes a certain type of personality for sure. Um, I, I would say so. Yeah. So, so what is your prep before the shoot? Oh, yeah. And I'm sure so, that uh, there's a lot of things. So work us through. They're on our, no, I love, love, love prep. So obviously, you know, I mean, a lot of people say movies are made in prep. Okay. So if you fail to prepare, um, you should prepare to fail. So um, I love prep. I get to read the script. You know, of course, as soon as I get the script, I dive right into it. Okay. It's like my favorite part. Um, I get really, really familiar with it. So I read it two or three times before I even start my continuity breakdown. The continuity breakdown, I like to tell people it's the one document that like we cannot make movies without because, you know, otherwise the footage would be useless and thrown away. We have to have a plan as we shoot completely out of continuity to make it seem as though it was shot in perfect sequential order and the script supervisor is in charge of creating that continuity breakdown. So after I've read the script and become very familiar with it, I dive into my continuity breakdown where I'm tracking every single element that goes into each scene, tracking it in order to keep it straight when we're shooting out of continuity. And I'm also catching story inconsistencies, um, story problems, anything that could jar the audience or not track. And I'm correcting those in prep. And then I'm distributing this information across multiple departments. So of course my um, you know, creative department heads, costumes, props, hair, makeup, um, possibly set dressing, possibly even, you know, depending on the script, um, picture cars. You know, like if I'm working on a, on a film or a TV show where a lot of the scenes are set in cars or vehicles, I might have a, a special meeting just with the picture car department to make sure I'm straight on all the vehicles. Um, I have a meeting with the first assistant director or the second assistant director, whoever is more available in prep. And we make sure that we're getting on the same page with story days, you know, that's which actions take place on which days in the story so that we're publishing all the paperwork correctly. If the AD were to produce a call sheet for, you know, tomorrow's work and they have their story days um, not matching mine and mine don't match costumes and costumes don't match props and so forth, we would be all mixed up and nothing would cut. So um, I'm always thinking about the edit and I'm thinking like a little, you know, mini producer. I'm trying to anticipate production problems that could cause delays on set. So um, I like to tell you know the people that I train is like you know you're 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 mini, put in your producer hat for a minute and consider how this could play out on set. So go the extra mile and make sure to resolve anything in prep that could cause a delay on set. Well, and that's interesting that you bring that up about the script because sometimes between scenes you really don't know how many days is that is that the same day yeah. um, because sometimes it's not always clear. Yeah, uh, and that would mean wardrobe. Um, oh, big changes. Time. Oh, absolutely. Stuff. Yes. Yeah. And of course, you know, the, the AD publishes what story days, you know, apply to the scene on the call sheet. So if their story days don't match wardrobe story days, we're going to have footage that doesn't work, that doesn't cut together. So, yes, I have to get costumes, hair, makeup, props, set dressing, AD, anyone else, if, you know, where continuity um, is an issue. I need to get everyone on the same page, especially about story days so that we never have an actor walking, you know, onto set in the wrong clothes. I mean, that's that's unsalvageable. That's called a reshoot, and that's what we don't want. Right. We cannot shoot actors in the wrong costumes. So um, do you have, like, a pre-production meeting with all those departments, or do you uh, get, you know, their contact and reach out to them directly? The latter, yeah. So um, we, we are... We do production meetings, but to wait until the production meeting to bring up these things would be way too late. You know, the production meetings are generally very close to when we start shooting. So as soon as I get my continuity breakdown figured out, I'm on the phone scheduling Zoom meetings or in-person meetings with those um, departments to make sure that we get on the same page. Wow. That, you know, that's a lot of responsibility. And and oh gosh, yes. th that's great that you're taking that on because I've always been curious about, um, you know, each of the departments has a set of things that they're supposed to be in charge of, but it seems like there's a lot of overlapping of those responsibilities. And then who is really in charge? You know, like, OK, uh, is the wardrobe department to get it right or is it the script supervisor to catch it? You know, like there's all yeah. these little 
you know, layovers or crossovers, crossovers. You are so, so, so correct. So I tell people, go out of your way to make your other departments look great. Go the extra mile. Set them up for success. Communicate ahead of time. Don't just make it their responsibility to figure it out on the day, especially if you can see a problem, you know, way ahead of time, which is one of the things that we really, we have to have those, you know, anticipation, like the ability to solve problems before they happen. So if I can see, okay, you know, for example, um, let's imagine we had a scene where there was a big, beautiful um, bouquet of flowers or something, this gorgeous, fresh bouquet of flowers that plays in the scene. And it should also be in the next scene, but we're not shooting the next scene for another three weeks because of actor availability or something. So the set needs to be a dead match, but we're shooting it like three weeks apart. I would go out of my way to photograph very thoroughly the beautiful bouquet of flowers and also send reminders to props and set dressing, whoever was handling it. If it's handled by an actor, it's a prop. Um, you know, we're going to see this exact specialty bouquet of flowers in another three weeks. So just, you know, pinging you, you know, about this. I know I don't want it to sneak up on you, but this is going to be playing in three weeks. So that's just, I mean, just one example. But um, I'm always going out of my way to make the other departments look great when it comes to continuity. And it always comes back um, to me and producers and directors appreciate it and know I'm in the background, you know, pulling strings and supporting people. So if you have that, you know, service oriented approach to it, it actually ends up making you look great at the same time. So it's just a better, a better way to do it. Well, I think you're hitting a really good point here. And I just think the going above and beyond. Wow. I mean, all I'm thinking about right now is, God, I want you on my shoots. Um, because a lot of times I don't think people always work together like that or, or, or take that extra mile. They kind of separate. Well, that's not, you know, my, my job. Um, and I kind of like that. I'm going to really start to bring that to other sets. I, I love talking to people because it makes me learn so much more and to think differently. So yeah. I just want to say thank you. That's thank you for all that you do. I mean, that's... Well, thank you for saying that. And yeah. I do think, you know, I, I really try to drive this home uh, to people that I'm training. It's like, we are not just a department of one, you know, like we are on a team. And if you do, like truly, it does reflect, it reflects on us when we go above and beyond and we do for others. Um, and don't ask for the credit. You know, the producers still know it's us. Um, there was another question that I just wanted to ask about, like when you're uh, reading the the script and you're doing a script breakdown or, you know, you're analyzing the script and you see some like maybe um, I forgot how you said it, but holes in the script, you refer to them as something. What did you, how did you say that? Oh, um, I think inconsistencies. Inconsistencies. Um, mm -hmm. OK, yeah. do you mind giving me an example of that, like where sure. you would see that? Um, there was a really, you know, just a simple example would be um, there was a scene, I think this was on the Watchmen pilot episode where a police officer pulls over someone in a pickup truck late at night and they say the date. OK, it's supposed to be a specific date, but then that date did not track with another date that's, uh, you know, said two or three days later in the story. So we had to catch that. I think also in the same scene, the police officer like identified himself with a particular ID number and then the number changed in the scene. You know, um, so we flagged that and, and got that corrected Um, there. You know, sometimes there are time inconsistencies, just passage of time inconsistencies. Like, yeah, I think I was doing a traveling a movie where a band was traveling like across the country in a bus. And there was a big old time inconsistency because they say how long it's supposed to drive coast to coast. Um, but the time that they left would never makes sense with the time that they arrive, you know, based on not stopping, which they state they don't stop, you know, except to just, you know, go to the bathroom or something and they right. eat on the bus and sleep on the bus. So just things like that where the audience is going to catch you. It's just a logic flaw that we need to go ahead and correct. So we just request a revision at that point. Um, so, yeah. Well, I think that that's a good point because I, I've seen that in shows where I'm watching it going, it would never happen or wait a minute, this doesn't really make sense. And now now it's all coming. It's in the script. And these are the things that are being caught right. sometimes. Right. Um, or and, maybe you changes know, later and, you know, you're not thinking back. Like maybe, Sure. If there's a revision, you know, issued about a completely different issue, well, you need to make sure every revision tracks with, you know, what else is in the script. So, um, oh, gosh, I had another example that I was thinking of. I just forgot it. Sorry, it fell out of my brain already. Oh, well. Uh, 
Well, if it comes back, you can always If it comes back, back, I'll jump in. Yeah. <laughs> so the other question that I have for you is what's in your toolkit? Like, what do you bring to set? Do you bring a table and a chair and, you know, like, tell me everything. Okay. So my toolkit is actually pretty slim, okay? Um, I will say that I script supervise using two different methods. So I do a digital method. I use a digital method, and I also still do some old school, old school paper and pencil script supervising, depending on the format. The old school script supervising is more for multi-camera sitcoms. Um, so my primary toolkit is my laptop. I actually don't use an iPad for my script supervision. I use my MacBook Air. I have Script E, which is um, just a digital script supervising software. I would say, in my opinion, it's I don't have any affiliation or anything like that with them. I love, love, love that product. Um, I do um, also know a little bit about scriptation. I've introduced some of my students to scriptation. I also have um, had students start with like, you know, Excel or Google Sheets um, if they want to be like sort of semi digital script supervisors. So, but personally, I have. The um, laptop, the Script D, um, there is a little device called a Black Magic Video Capture, and that pumps in a feed from the monitors straight into my program. So I don't even have to look at the monitors. I can look at a little window right on my laptop as I'm typing up my notes in the scene. There's also a built in stopwatch in that program. I have this awesome little mini desk. I've had it for ages. Um, it's actually the, the person who created Script D recommended this specific one to me like, gosh, 14 years ago. And I still have the same one. There are newer, cooler, lighter ones out there, but I'm very attached to this one. I've had it, the metal repaired and reworked a bunch of times, but it's just like a little tripod with a little um, desktop. So it's like my little portable um, office. Um, goodness gracious. And then I always, always, always wear cargo pants on set. Um, and you put sides and a pencil in one pocket. I have a, an external camera that I do like to use. Um, I can pull stills straight from Scripty, but I also like to have a point and shoot camera. Um, and I don't use my phone for continuity photos ever. I like to keep a um, completely separate device for work photos and keep my phone out of the equation. And that's pretty much it for digital script supervising. For the old school script supervising, it's that stand that I just described. Um, a physical stopwatch that is a silent stopwatch that's like $15 on Amazon, an actual ruler, like the old school wooden ruler that I used in second grade, you know, not the same one, but it looks just like it, pencils, um, and a, the external uh, point and shoot camera. So, and a binder, you know, so that I can line my script and, and, and do my script notes physically. And then can you walk us through the stopwatch? When do you start? When do you stop? And talk us through that. So the goal of timing the, the shots is to figure out an accurate timing of how it's going to cut together, how the scene is going to cut together in the edit. So I'm timing every angle, every take of every angle that we're shooting and piecing them together to arrive at an estimated time that I think the scene will run. My goal is to give the producers and the editor my best guess as we shoot as to how we're doing on time. So we might be, let's imagine we were like a third of the way through a feature film shoot or something. And I had estimated just in prep that the script would run, you know, I don't know, 110 minutes or something like that. I'm just making something up. And a third of the way into the shoot, we're at like 135 minutes. That's going to cue the producers to consider maybe making some cuts because we're overshooting and we're throwing away money basically because a lot of that footage will not be usable if they want to keep it to 112 minutes or something like that. So I'm timing the angles, each take of the angles, and building out an edit to estimate um, the runtime for that scene, which I put on my paperwork at the end of the day. So if we've done, you know, scenes three, five, and seven, um, I, you know, I'm just reporting how much each I think will run and what our total runtime shot for today was, in my opinion, in my expert opinion. Wow. Uh, okay. So let's let me just be clear because sometimes this happens. Um, okay, so the the actresses, or I'm sorry, the actor, the director says, "Action, stop." You start it, yeah. and then when he says "cut," you stop it. Or what if he says, "Okay, wait a minute, let's do a series of takes." Yeah. like then you stop it and start it for each and one? track each time and okay. track each time. So and and scripty actually again, this probably sounds like a scripty commercial. I'm not scripty is good, but there are other options too. But within Scripty, you can stop and start for each run. So let's say you did 10 runs within one take. 
um, it's timing each individual run in the same way that I would do it and write it down um, handwritten. So yes, it does get to be a little bit tricky with the paperwork when the directors don't cut and do a proper, you know, slate for another take. But that's just part of, you know, shooting on cards now, you know, it's just that we can just keep keep rolling. So sometimes, I mean, I've been on sets where we have a 30 minute take, you know, we shoot the whole scene without ever cutting all the, you know, all the cutting is done within, um, you know, just the cameras pushing in. And so the editor has a lot of extra work, you know, um, to, to cut all that out. But um, yeah, so it's just a matter of tracking the duration of each run of each angle. I love it. Yeah. Um, and then where do you position yourself on set? Right next to the director. Um, so you will every now and again get an AD or, you know, just a set that's very tight and the AD might be like, okay, so we can only have the director and the actors in this room. And it's like, and me, like, I, I have to see, I truly have to be right next to the director. I have to share a brain with the director. I have to know exactly what they're thinking, not only to give the editor their roadmap for cutting it to the director's liking, whether the director is t remembering to turn to me or not and say, okay, Jennifer, I loved um, take three of the master and take 11 for the kiss. That was the best one. So let's use that. If they're forgetting to do that, you know, there's a lot going on. They might be very, very occupied. I still know what they want because I'm right next to them focused on reading them. So I, I can hear them swearing under their breath when the actor, you know, blew the line again or the actor, you know, turned over the wrong shoulder again or something. I can hear them calling the AD over and going, that background actor is looking right in the lens every time my actor, you know, starts talking. So please just either have them turn around or I'm going to have to pull them out. I hear everything. Right. Okay. So I need to be right next to the director, hearing and feeling what they like and don't like, and eyes on the monitors. That is one of the most important things. It is not, I cannot just watch a rehearsal and then go off and, and do my job without seeing exactly what we're shooting. I have to know what's being established and what's not on camera. I have to know when booms and flags dip in. I truly have to keep my eyes bouncing to my page, you know, and focused on continuity and watching the performances as we shoot on, like within the actual frame lines, like not naked eye, but rather what the monitors are showing me. So what the camera sees, I need to see during every take. Okay. The sound person usually gives you a headset too. Headset. Okay. When are you taking pictures? Uh, are you taking pictures of the monitor? I'm doing both. Okay. So I'm taking pictures both either like my direct feed um, from the monitors and with my naked eye. Okay. So the, the frame lines help me know what was established and what wasn't established. The naked eye photos help me dot like zoom in on details that I maybe can't quite see with my um, screen grab photos. Okay. Or my frame line photos. So I can go, you know, step right up to the couch because the blankets and the pillows were, you know, tossed aside in a really particular way. So I have to work closely with the set dresser to make sure we reestablish the blankets and pillows the same way all day long while we're in this scene, you know, or um, there just might be other details. Yeah. That I just can't quite see from my screen grab. So I, I do both. And so I take pictures um, initially when I were, you know, when we're establishing the set and I know that the set is locked, we're not going to change anything. I take pictures so I know to go back to that set dressing. I also take pictures normally during like sort of the final take of the master and I have to kind of read the director for that. Like, are we going to go again or are we like pretty locked in on this master? Like we're happy with this. I'll take pictures when the characters move. Okay. When, when there's any movement in the scene because we cut on uh, motion. So those are kind of like, a, it's like a little cheat sheet of what the cut points are. So, you know, the, your eye is like watching so many things. Um, we cannot remember everything. So if I give myself this huge volume of information by taking photos of any time there's movement, I can quickly check back and see, you know, Jennifer's hair when she stood up, you know, did she pop it, you know, over her shoulder, you know, or, you know, just anything that might change during the scene. Having those little photos, it's like a little cheat sheet of all of the matching details. Does that make sense? Oh, God, yeah. And it's okay. so, it's, I'm stressed. Um, <laughs> I don't know how you're not stressed so, about that. It's but, so fun. But how do you like, you know, uh, w let's talk continuity plus dialogue. So how are you looking at the, di and I get it. A lot of times it's a couple of takes. So by the time maybe you're focused more on the dialogue and then maybe you're but how do you like focus on, did they say it correctly? Plus, wait, which hand did they pick that, that bottle up from? I mean, how, and then, and then their hair. I mean, it's so much to, and they take a picture too. So honestly, it, it, 
it gets really easy once you've done it a number of times, okay? Like, or I would say after you do it a few times, um, it's scary the first couple of times, but then you get good when you have a system that works. So um, let's start with, okay, so the first question would be, how do I track dialogue and action at the same time? So I like to tell people we're not just seeing it for the first time when we roll our first take. I've seen it like 15 times by this point. You know, we've done a blocking rehearsal together. I was in that private rehearsal with the director and actors. I know everything they did it like. I know everything we settled on. Then we go and show it to the whole crew for a marking rehearsal. Okay. And then we're talking shots and I'm thinking about angles and I'm just thinking about the cut already at that point. The actors are, you know, over there getting, you know, camera ready for the last time. We're dialing in the lights and the camera on the stand-ins. Fine. The actors are coming to set. We're going to shoot our first take of the master. I know the scene really well at this point, And I have notes that are very, very easy for me to follow because I have a system for, you know, cueing myself when it comes to dialogue or action notes. Like all of my dialogue modifications go on the right side of the page. All of my action notes go on the left side. I have, you know, arrows and sketches anytime there's movement. Um, let me try. I hope I'm not getting like too all no, over the place. No, okay. I think it's really important to understand what goes yeah. into this. So I have all of these notes there to support me and I'm tracking along the page and I'm, my eyes are going up and down from page to actors. Okay. I don't necessarily take those um, matching in motion shots during the first couple of takes of the master. I'm probably just concentrating on making sure that we nail the blocking because, you know, let's say we tried four or five different versions in rehearsal. I want to make sure that one of the actors doesn't, you know, let slip up and go back to, you know, version four from rehearsal. So I'm watching to make sure that this is the blocking that we decided on and that the lines are there. By the time we're getting close to moving away from the master, and again, this you get a better sense of that, the better you know your director and how many takes they like to do. Slash, you can just ask the director, you know, are we just like, if we're really behind today, are we just doing like one good master and then moving on? You're like, how many takes do you think? I just want to make sure um, I take my photos when I need to. I'm very clear and open about how my process and, you know, it's never a problem. So when I'm at the place where I think we're about to move on, I will take photos on any cut points, anytime the actors move so that I can go back and refer to those when we start pushing in. It truly is just a matter of having all of your tools right in front of you. You know, I've already given myself the tools to track continuity and action back in rehearsal. You know, I've reviewed them. I'm scanning along. Like, there's really just no need to panic. I have the information there in front of me. So um, let's let's take the example of um, when I do multi-camera sitcoms. Sometimes that's like really, really long scenes with like a gajillion characters, okay? Um, and I have all of the blocking sketched out. So anytime there's movement, I have a new a new drawing down the right side of my page. So I can see if it's, you know, Jennifer and Tammy talking for half a page of dialogue, no one's moving. If And then when there's a, a new drawing on my page, that means there has been movement. So I follow the arrow. Okay, Jennifer's going to the front door, you know? So let's just take an example of, let's imagine I look up and I see that someone has taken off a coat and I'm totally missed it, okay? And I have to go back and match that in the next angle. As soon as we call cut, I zip over to the actor and I say, okay, I see that in this section of dialogue, your coat somehow came off. I don't have a drawing. You know, this was the first time I saw that happen. Um, where did you take your coat off just within this amount of page? Oh, yeah, I took it off when um, Brian said it was getting hot. You know, I just decided to try that, you know? Oh, okay. Well, I think we're going to keep that take. So let's have you repeat that um, every take going forward. The director loved that take. So that's going to be what we match to. I have so many tools that point me towards the information that I need very quickly. I got it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. And then with all the pictures that you're taking, how long do you keep them for? Do you know, I actually keep them kind of forever. I, you know, it's so, and they're just on a hard drive, you know. Um, I have never been on a show where production required me to turn over my photos. I'm not allowed to share my photos or anything, but I've never been required to turn them over. Whereas they do make um, costumes and probably hair and makeup, like they make them turn in a continuity book. Um, I just turn in like my continuity notes at the end of the show. I've never been asked to turn over my photos. And so I have thousands of photos on my hard drive. Wow. Okay. External hard drive. Yeah. Okay. So how do you work with the director? Are, are there any specific questions that you ask them ahead of time to kind of know what they want to focus on or anything? I, 
I do. I ask them um, how they want me to work with the actors first. Like, is it okay with you if I just step in and talk to them? Or do you prefer that I talk to you first before giving a note? Um, yeah, I ask them, you know, how married, you know, to the exact dialogue are you? Do you want me to correct actors if they are um, changing just one or two words or if they change the actual meaning of a line or drop a line? Um, you know, I'm usually just asking like what their preferences are for how I interact with them. I will oftentimes ask, you know, when I catch mistakes on camera, I don't want you wasting money when something is wrong. So is it OK with you if I just point at it, you know, or if I just tap you and, you know, point at my my sides or something? Um, I just ask them how they want to be interacted with. And it works really, really well. You know, I mean, you know, by the end of the day, you already have like a warm relationship with your director because you're a foot away from each other all day. You have very, very like shared interests and um you know, I'm, I'm just all about the work on set and having a great time. And it's just a good vibe. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And because um, you really have the uh, the director's back. So I would think oh, that that gosh, would yes. be a just as good of a relationship as the DP with them is the script supervisor, because you're going to catch things that they're not necessarily going to be focused on. Truly, truly. They can sometimes they can single task and just focus on performance. I have to be thinking about the edit. I have to think about how this all fits together. I have to figure, you know, I have to be thinking about anything that could bump the audience and take them out of it. You know, the worst thing in the world to hear is that, you know, we we missed something or we have to reshoot something. Um, that is a horrible, horrible feeling. So I work really, really hard to make sure that we nail it um, every single scene, every single angle, you know, and it's actually it's great, great fun. So that's that's a joy for me to do. Yeah. And you also have to be aware of crossing the line, too. Right. Big time. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yes. <laughs> Oh, gosh, yes. That was fun my first year because I, you know, I came up like, you know, just so it was like during the writer's strike when I got into film and TV. But then the writer's strike of 2007, 2008 ending actually very much benefited me. Like the strike benefited me in the sense that there was this tidal wave of work, you know, backlog production. And I just worked nonstop for like three years and I got really good really fast. But I was, you know, so I was doing all of these shows, like ramming my schedule full of work. And it was um, definitely interesting, like getting really good at eyelines really fast. You know, it was intimidating at first. You know, I felt like I was, you know, it was Greek trigonometry in the very beginning. But um, when you truly break it down, you know, one set of eyes to another set of eyes is just one line. You know, like we really, really do break down eyelines one set of eyes at a time. So I can now just like look at an auditorium of people, you know, and know how to shoot it from every single side of the room and get every you know, eyeline, right? Because it's just, it's just simple lines, honestly. It got so easy is what I'm trying to say. It seemed really hard at first and then it got really, really easy. Well, it is kind of daunting when you go into a new uh, position because you don't know. And then, you know, give yourself six months and then it's like, oh my gosh, now it's like rote. <laughs> I know, it's like so obvious, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but that's fine. No, it's still when, when you know, camera operators and, and even DPs and, and directors and stuff get tripped up, you know, I've I've had so much practice at this now that like I just always know the right answer when it comes to islands. It's just yeah, thousands and thousands of times practicing it, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you work with the actors? Oh, I love working with actors. So we have to support the actors. But it's it's really wise to establish warm, trusting relationships with the actors because they, you know, they have a lot on the line. They're bearing their souls in front of the camera. Um, it is not cool to just be at Video Village, you know, barking lines or barking orders from set. That is just not the way that, you know, that information should be transmitted. So I go up to actors and warmly, you know, give them notes just, you know, just to let you know, like in this last take, you actually stood up a line later than the previous take. The director would like to go back to the previous version, if you don't mind. Or, um, you know, even talking, you know, um, previous circumstances and where we're going, you know, talking, you know, what the what the context of the scene is, you know. Talking continuity, you know, a lot of times actors will come up to me and ask about matching information as opposed to relying on costumes or hair and makeup. You know, they want to come see it from me. Um, I rehearse with them, you know, on the side, even, you know, just drilling lines and, um, you know, even working on scenes that we're going to do in a, a couple of weeks or something like that. If they have some kind of big high pressure scene that they want to drill and run with me, I'm just really there for them. You know, I call myself like an actor sidekick or an actor wingman, you know, like I'm truly just there for them and it's a joy to work with them. Honestly, the actors are usually the hardest working people on set and the most and the toughest and most dedicated and the sweetest. Like, I just I can't say enough good things about my actors. You know, it's great working with actors. 
So how do you approach an actor? Um, because I know that everybody has a different style. Um, I was on set and I was watching one of the actors and they wanted quiet. They didn't want anybody to say anything. And then other actors might be more like, oh, hey, did I say that line right? Or where did... So do you do something ahead of time when you're talking to them? Do you ask them certain questions? Like, how do you like to be approached? What do you, yeah. you know, like, so what are your go-to questions to ask an actor? Um, I mean, I, I don't necessarily, I kind of figured out as I go, but I always introduce myself and, you know, just say I'm excited about, you know, working with them or excited about the senior to say something positive, you know, just make them feel comfortable with me right out of the gate. And then I, yeah, I might just ask them like, how, how do you want to, you know, receive notes? Like, are you, are you cool if I just step right in or, you know, you don't want me to like knock, knock and be like, is this a good time? <laughs> you know, or, <laughs> you know, how do you, how do you want that to go? You know, it's just, they're just people, you know, like, that, you know, even if they're huge, huge Hollywood stars, or if my director is like this huge Hollywood, you know, um, powerhouse, you know, director or producer or something, they're people and people skills, you know, are kind of universal. So, you know, be kind, be generous you know, listen, um, be respectful and have a great time, you know? So does that answer your question? Yes. Yes, it did. Okay. So, <laughs> um, you've also worked, I mean, you primarily work in TV and you've also worked in film. Is there a different approach when working in a, you know, a TV versus a film? Um, TV is generally, um, faster paced. So it's just, um, th there's just truly a need for speed and accuracy. So not that there isn't on film shoots, but, I mean, it's, it's, I would say it's more high pressure and just, yeah, like th there's just not any time to waste. So I would say, gosh, working faster and just making sure I am on the ball with absolutely everything because there's just less room for error. Right. Yeah. Um, so what's the hardest part about your job for you? Um, the changing hours. That's the only thing that I would change about film and television shoots is starting at 6 a.m. on a Monday and starting at 6 p.m. on a Friday, you know, so that I'm wrapping at 8 a.m. on Saturday. Do you see what I'm saying? So if we have to, like, you know, give the actors turnarounds or give the crew turnaround, we might be starting super, super early on a Monday morning and our start times just push throughout the week. And that gets to be really exhausting, changing your, um, you know, you can't ever, like, have a natural sleep pattern when you start at 6 a.m. on a Monday and 6 p.m. on a Friday. So that's the one thing I would say is the hardest part. Um, in the beginning, I also, you know, w was really hard on myself about never feeling like I could step away from a set. So I would like deliberately like avoid drinking water and just like chew gum to quench my thirst. And that had a toll on yeah. my body. So, um, you know, while the director at, you know, while we are very much needed on set, like we do have to like strategically plan when to take breaks, you know, just run, you know, 10 one, as they say, like run to the bathroom and have a little snack and some water. Um, and recharge. Um, so being, I, I definitely have, you know, an internal pressure to just be on all the time, you know, 12 hours, 14 hours, whatever. Um, so forcing myself to sit or, or take a, a short breather is um, something I, I still struggle with. Um, you don't feel like you can do that when they're setting up for the next shot? Or because TV, there's very little turnaround. I mean, is it on a set where everything's lit? So it's just like, okay, let's move the camera and now let's go. Some formats are like that. Some formats are like that for sure. And some studios that I work with are like that. Um, it's not necessarily that. It's that I just feel like I need to be there. You know, the director does depend on me. The producer depends on me. There is always some problem to solve and figure out. And I just like being in, like, I would never be comfortable um, in a video village, like, you know, 50 yards away or something like with a bunch of producers. Like, I have to be a few feet from camera. I just feel like that's just the way that I work. Um, it's probably just a personality thing. Um, I don't want to miss a thing. So it's more an internal pressure and a personality thing. Okay. Um, so what, what do you love about your job? Oh, my gosh. What don't I love right. about my job? <laughs> um, I just love being in the, like, frankly, just like the inner circle, like just being like right in the cockpit. It, it's such a, it's such a sensual role. You know, I mean, it's, I'm practically, you know, I'm, I'm two feet away from set, you know, I'm, I'm five feet from camera. It's just so much fun. I would say my favorite thing, working with actors and directors. If there's a specific task you want me to name, what's my favorite task? I love rehearsing. It's like that's the experimentation phase, you know, like we're experimenting with how we're going to tell the story of the scene, you know, so that's great. And also that first private director's rehearsal of the day. Um, you know, there are like 200 people waiting outside, like waiting for the day to start. And it's like the one like quiet, you know, half hour where it's just, you know, creators, you know, and we're just experimenting and playing. 
Um, so that's a pretty cool. That's probably my favorite part of the day, I would say. What are you working on now? Do you have any projects or anything? Yeah. So my favorite project uh, right now is training other people to do what I do. So I have like a very unique, um, I would say, disruptive method for putting people to work as script supervisors. And then I'm seeing amazing results. They're seeing amazing results, you know, leveraging it to get screenwriting gigs, um, directing gigs, producing gigs. And I mean, really, really, really fast. So I'm really proud of that. Um, I did develop a super uh, fast system for putting people to work. I did that out of necessity because I have had a lot of experience at a very high volume, fast paced TV studio. And I created a method that works like lightning fast. So, um, yeah, so I'm training uh, future script supervisors, uh, screenwriters, directors, producers, actors, and they are getting in via this awesome script supervisor um, training. And, and what's your website? So it's scriptsupervisorceo.com. I do have a um, link right on the homepage to get free training just to see if it's something that you're interested in. If you think it would be a method that would work for you. If you have creative work that you want to get in front of, you know, get past gatekeepers and get in front of decision makers, um, you know, getting in via the often overlooked uh, script supervisor role is a really smart way to do it. And also, we are really, really short on script supervisors in the industry. It's always a struggle to find qualified script supervisors. So um, the job market for script supervisors is great. So that's a, an advantage as well. So do you have any last thoughts for, for our show? Um, I would just say that um, there's a whole lot of misunderstanding about this role. Um, you know, it's not really covered that well in film school, from what I understand. Film programs don't go, you know, deep dive into this. People don't seem to go to film school to learn to become script supervisors. Um, I think it's an overlooked and very impactful role that more, more people should consider because it's kind of like instant inner circle access, like your first day. Um, so, you know, some of my like one of my actor, you know, trainees, like she's uh, using it. Basically, she said to bypass gatekeepers and get her real um, in front of people that she befriends, you know, that she actually, you know, has trusting relationships with on the other side of a project. But she's walking away with all these great connections that can help her acting career. So I think more people should look at it for access to, um, you know, the inner circle. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. This was great. I'm so glad that you had me. Thank you so very much for um, a wonderful interview. Oh, my gosh, I didn't believe. I can't believe it's been 47 minutes. Okay, I felt like we've been on the phone for, you know, 10 minutes. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening. I encourage you to get out there and make a film. Reach out to your local filmmakers group to get involved and connect. Please subscribe to the show if you like it. And follow me on Instagram at Tammy McGarrow. Until we meet again, what's your story? What's your story?